How about now? Good morning and happy Father's Day. I'll catch up sooner or later. Uh, just a word before I get into our message and talking about fathers and the Father's Day and the Father's Blessing. Uh, many of you are off aware, awfully made aware of what happened in Charleston, South Carolina, the shooting in the church. You know, I've uh, watched all the political pundits and the square heads run to the TV and say all they're going to say, but some are lost in all this, I think, is uh, the fact that this is a church and these are our brothers and sisters in Christ and they're suffering tremendously and hurting desperately at the loss of a pastor, their, their family members, their loved ones. And I just feel that this morning we just take a moment and let's just lift up our brothers and sisters in Christ in Charleston this, this, after, this morning and pray for them, pray for God's grace to be on them. So I, I would encourage you right there where you're seated. If you haven't taken time to pray for these folks, you would do so right now. Lift them up to the Lord and ask God to minister his grace to them as we do so. Father, we come to you. And Lord, I can't even imagine where that church is emotionally this morning and what they're struggling with and all they're going through. Lord, even in the light of the things we've been preaching recent weeks about the last days, you tell us that evil men will wax worse and worse, and we see it more so than any other time. We know that you're the answer. And Father, we also know that in this moment of sorrow and grief, you proclaim yourself in the word of God as the God of all comfort. And Lord, our prayer is that you would just hover and surround and comfort those folks this day as they meet. Your presence would be so mighty and be felt in their midst. Your spirit would minister, Lord, in the, in the absence, Lord, of so many. You'd minister your grace and your peace and your comfort to these hurting souls. We lift up our brothers and sisters in Christ today and ask you for your hand of mercy to be upon their lives. God, you're the only one who can do what needs to be done in our nation. I know that there are others who think that we can pass a law or change something or do something. But Lord, we know what we need is your grace and your mercy. So at this same time, we ask you to heal our nation. God, to bring us to you, to draw us to your heart, to so in some way, Father, it'd be such a sovereign move of your spirit that we would experience a, a national awakening that would move our hearts and change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray this and we thank you for answered prayer. Amen. 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 Continue to lift these folks up in your prayers. We get into our message this day on Father's Day. It's always approached Father's Day with a little bit of mixed blessings. Uh, my father passed away on Father's Day. Uh, you know, my dad... Some of y'all have heard my testimony and we shared about this before. Uh, he was one of those absentee fathers. I didn't see him a lot, usually in the summer for a couple of weeks growing up. We'd go see my dad and spend some time with him. And what I want to share with you today is about the blessing of a father. It's not about the blessing of being a father. It's about what a father needs to do and, and to be a blessing. Some of the things that I'm going to share with you today uh, come from a heart that really, I believe, uh, looks to God for us to find out what a real father is like and to emulate that and to be like that kind of heavenly father. Having the absence like that, only in later teen years of having someone, a stepdad who sought to fill those roles, but I was leaving home at that time already. Uh, but through the years, filled some of those roles up. I really felt it imperative once I met the Lord and, and received from him uh, the acceptance and the significance and the grace that God wants fathers to impart to their children on some level. It wasn't until uh, uh, I accept the Lord that I experienced those things. But after I did, I had the blessing of having children in there into our family. And at that point, me and the father had a long time together and spent a lot of time about wanting to know what it meant to really be a father and what kind of father to be and sought to seek the Lord as a model. I certainly was, was nowhere near perfect in, in that role in, in, in family, but it was my heart to provide my children a dad, you know, and a father that loved Jesus and would be a father that, uh, that, uh, that would be present and would have the impact upon their lives that God intended fathers to have. We do not have to look far to see what a, a, a real father should be. We're living in a day and age when there is an absentee of fathers. They may be present in the home, but they're not really present many times in fulfilling the role that God would have them fulfill. And you see the tremendous 
effects of the, that absentee father in, in our culture today. I think it's affecting us on so many different levels, more than what most people probably even realize. But if we want to know what a father's like, then we look to our heavenly father and discover what a father's like. We see that the scriptures calls him, Jesus refers to him as daddy in the, in the Hebrew culture. The way we would say the word is the word Abba. It means dad, father, that, that in, closest intimate term that you can relate to your father, to your dad, it, you would express to him in saying that word to him, daddy, father. So we look to the scriptures. Now I want to look at a scripture that you might not think we should kind of go to, to look at, because in Genesis 27 is where we're going to be looking at in scriptures today. And Genesis 27 has a family that what we would call in our cultural terms today, dysfunctional. All right. This is Jacob's family, Jacob and Rebecca. You can capitalize D for dysfunctional here. They were two different paths they're following. You had Esau and Jacob, two sons in the family. One was a mama's boy, one was a daddy's boy. They played favorites to these children. And of course, there was a lot of problems that followed as a result of it. I do believe Jacob was a man of God, but certainly there were some things here that were just uh, not all that they should have been and all they could have been. So as we look at the story today, I, I really want you to understand that there's some poignant things that we can learn even from, from, from what it means to really be father. I did look up uh, father in the, in the dictionary. Have you ever done that before? Just before the word father is the word fatigued. <laughs> and just after the word father is the word fathead. So for all you fatigued and fathead fathers, happy Father's Day. I know your pain. Amen. <laughs> but it's an important role. Uh, I did also see a, 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 a recent cartoon with Calvin. Y'all know who Calvin is, the little kid, you know, in, in the... Uh, Calvin and Hobbes is, the, is the, the article. And he's sitting in class and he raises his hand in class. And, you know, his, obviously, warily, his teacher who knows him well, Mrs. Wormwood, she asks, you have a question, Calvin? Here, here's what he says. Yes, ma'am. What assurance do I have that this education is adequately preparing me for life in the 21st century? He continues to wax elegant. He stood, stands up and he says, and am I getting the skills I need to compete effectively in this tough global economy? Dramatically ending his speech, he raises his clenched fist and says, I want a high paying job when I get out of here. I want opportunity. I want success. Mrs. Wormwood walks over and taps his desk with her little pointer, looks down at Calvin and says, in that case, young man, I suggest you start working harder. What you get out of school depends upon what you put into it. Calvin's response, oh, then forget it. <laughs> so. Calvin needed some further direction in his life. Amen. Thankfully, every child's not like Calvin. I did read this poem that really spoke to my heart. It went like this. To get his good night kiss, he stood beside my chair one night and raised an eager face, a face with love alight. As I gathered in my arms the son that God gave to me, I thanked the lad for being good and hoped he'd always be. His little arms crept around my neck and then I heard him say, Four simple words I'll never forget, four words that made me pray. They turned a mirror on my soul, on secrets that no one knew, then startled me. I hear them yet. He said, Father, I'll be like you. We definitely want to be the kind of father that models what true fatherhood is like. In Genesis 27, in this story about Jacob, it's the story about extending the birthright to an eldest son. And this is Jacob as he's standing before his family, realizing that, that there's not much time in his life yet. He's grown old. He's, 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 he's blind now. And he's, he's at this responsibility of extending now the leadership of the family and of the home to the oldest son, who is Esau. The youngest son, excuse me, uh, I mean Isaac and Rebecca, I said Jacob. The youngest son is, is, is Jacob. And in the course of the, in the events of the story, through deception of Rebecca, the old man extends the blessing to the wrong child, not to Esau, but to, to, to Jacob. These are, are twin sons, but they weren't identical twins. In fact, they weren't anything alike when you read the story. They're two completely different kind of characters. Uh, Esau is that wild outdoor sportsman, you know. Uh, he, he's, he's, he's that man's macho man that we would see. He's burly, he's, he's hairy, he's big, he's, he's strong, he's a hunter, he's a sportsman. And then there's his other brother, the, the twin. And uh, he's not the oldest of the twin boys, so the blessing doesn't belong to him. 
the blessing now was a really a, it was a in the in the Hebrew culture it was a it was a formal uh, declaration uh, a delegation of the father's role in in so many ways where the father would extend to the oldest son uh, not just the blessing but responsibilities what came along with the blessing was a double portion of the inheritance instead of getting a portion he got a double portion due to the fact that he would be in charge and he would have the responsibilities of leading the family. So Esau is getting old and he's come to the place where he realizes it's time to extend this blessing and bestow it upon the oldest son. In verses two and four, we'll look at the whole chapter in just a moment, but it says something like this. I am now old. I'm old and I know that the day of my death is soon. Now, I want you Esau to take your weapons, grab your arrows and go take game from the field, prepare it, bring it to me, and then I will extend you the blessing before I die. So Esau leaves, gets his hunting equipment, heads out the door. Meanwhile, here's Rebecca hearing what's going on. The mother, she seizes this opportunity to secure the blessing for the younger twin, whose name is Jacob, who is, by the way, her favorite. Not like his brother at all. So Esau leaves while he's gone. Rebecca begins to run in and prepares a meal. Uh, and she needs to deceive the old man into giving the blessing to the younger son. And so she prepares this tasty food. She tells Jacob to put on Esau's uh, best clothes, go into his closet, get his clothing. And then she even puts goat skins on his hands and his arms uh, to make him feel hairy. And she sends him in to the blind father who's waiting for Esau to return with the food and to ask for the blessing. So as you read the story, and we'll start in Genesis 27, verse 18, you see there's a little suspicion in, in Jacob's voice, is, uh, in Isaac's voice as he listens to what's going on. Uh, I've got these stories all wrong. Give me a minute. It's been a long morning, by the way. I'll get my Isaac's and Jacob's right in a minute, all right? But bear with me. In 18, here it happens. He comes to his father and he says to Jacob does to his father, my father. And he said, here am I. Did I just pass it up? Here am I. Who are you, my son? And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. So get up and please sit and eat my game that you may bless me. And Isaac said to his son, how is it you have it so quickly, my son? And he said, because the Lord has caused it to happen to me or the Lord has blessed me. What's he saying? Well, remember, it's not the son it should be. He, it's deception. He's put on the clothes. He's got the hairy arms. Even Jacob saying, who, who is it? He said, it's me. I've come in to receive the blessing. Here's your meal. Verse 21 and tw through 26, Isaac speaks to Jacob. Isaac said to Jacob, please come close that I may feel you, my son, whether you're really my son Esau or not. A little suspicion is still in the air, right? So Jacob came close to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands, they're the hands of Esau. There was the furry. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. And so he blessed him, which got me thinking Esau must have some hairy hands. All right. Verse 24. And he said, are still suspicious. Are you really my son Esau? Then the lie. I am. So he said, Bring it to me. I will eat of my son's game that I may bless you. And he brought it to him and he ate and he also brought him wine and he drank. And the father, Isaac, said to him, please come close and kiss me, my son. Now, now comes the part as he continues with the, the, the fraud. It, it's interesting because at this place he comes close. Esau smells him. He kisses him. Well, here, here, let's look at verse 27. And he came close and he kissed him. And when he smelled the smell of his garments, he blessed him and said, see, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Now may God give you the dew of heavens and the fatness of the earth and the abundance of grain and new wine. May people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master of your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be those who curse you and bless those who bless you. Now, after receiving the blessing from his father, even though in deception, what's he do? He slips off. Here comes Esau. Esau comes in. He's killed the game. He's prepared it. It's ready to go. And he comes in and he offers it to his father. And Isaac freaks. He says he's trembled, the scripture says. And he said, who was it then that hunted the game and brought it to me? And I ate all of it. And I blessed him. This is what he says. And yea, he shall be blessed. 
See, this was a legal binding obligation of a father to the eldest son, but it was to ever whom the father placed the blessing on. Didn't have to be the eldest. Normally it would be the eldest in most situations. But because of the deception of Rebekah and Jacob, the blessing goes no, not to Esau, but it goes. And when Esau heard this, verse 34, he said, when he heard his father's words, he cried out with an exceeding great bitter cry and said to his father, bless me also, father, bless me. But he could not because the blessing had already been extended to the other son. Now, I looked at this story and I thought, you know, there's so many things wrong with this family at this point. <laughs> You know, there's so much going on that's not right. But there are some things here in regard to this blessing that I think are important for dads today. If you're here, this sermon is for you. All right. There are just some, I think there are four ingredients that if they are present in your life as a father and practice as a father to your children, to your sons and daughters, I think it'll make a tremendous and incredible difference in the life of your family. I think your children will grow up to be more secure and more confident in themselves and able to go out into the world that God's called us to go out into and function in the way that God's called them to go out and function. I, I, so I just want to take this, this prayer and this encounter of this blessing and dissect it. In fact, I, I can't take uh, the uh, ownership of this, one, because it's the Word of God, two, because the four points that I'm taking are variation on the, on, the, on the points made by Gary Smalley in his book entitled The Blessing, where he takes this particular portion of scripture and breaks it down into four ingredients. And so I'm doing plagiarizing a little bit this morning, but I think it's very important. They're critical points for us to hear. The first element it talks about in the blessing of a father that he gives to his children should be this, a meaningful touch. Meaningful touch. It, it says here in, in verse 22, Jacob went close to his father, Isaac, who touched him. Verse 26 says, then his father Isaac said to him, come here, my son, and kiss me. So there's this touching and there's this kissing. Now, this is not an isolated event in Scripture, this issue about touching, as a parent especially. It's important. Even the mindset and the, the idea of where we come as a church and we as a church show our approval of somebody when we license them to ministry or they're ordained to a particular role, it is a very important act where the laying on of hands takes place and this touching takes place, showing approval and showing acceptance. When your child is first brought in your home, they don't understand English. Sometimes I wonder if they go back to that when they turn teenagers, all right? But <laughs> they don't understand language. But what they do understand is touch. What they do understand is embrace, the way you communicate your love. Now, this is a natural probably for most mothers in this room. Maybe not all were like that. But one of those things about a mom is there's a normal thing about touch, but dads need to be encouraged in this regard that dads learn how to show a loving embrace to their children because it is a sign of blessing and it is an act of, of compassion that a child needs to receive and learn. In Mark chapter 10, you may recall the story how Jesus is in the crowd, there's many people around him and now parents are beginning to bring their children to Jesus. And they want Jesus to bless their children. Again, in the mindset of the Hebrew culture, this is not unusual to take and have a laying on a hand and an acceptance. Remember what Jesus said? First of all, he rebuked the disciples because they wouldn't. He said, suffer the little children come to me. All right, bring them here. And it says that Jesus took the time and he sat down and he began to touch each child. It says he took them, placed them on his knees. He laid his hand upon them and he spoke blessing upon their life. This is so critical. Jesus knew exactly what children need to feel love, to feel acceptance. And so he touches them and he blesses them. And throughout the scripture, when you see these blessings being parted, how often is the time, whether there's an embrace or whether there's a kiss or whether there's a laying on of hands. It's important as dads to do this. You may have grown up in a home like I did where you didn't have a dad, but that doesn't mean you don't do it. Some people say, well, I just didn't grow up in a touchy kind of feely kind of family like that. And, and some of you, you know, can relate to that because you didn't have that. It wasn't expressed, but it's never too late to start as a dad expressing that to your children or to your grandchildren and let them know that there is more than just words. You, you genuinely do take time to make contact and communicate with them on this level. Remember, Jacob and Esau, how old are they? Well, we know that, you know, that we're talking there, they're in their 40s here. You know, and Isaac takes them and he touches them and he kisses them and conveys this message of blessing. 
So the second point is this. Beyond a meaningful touch is the spoken message of affection and love. And you say, where, where is that in the passage? Well, as, as his son comes near to him, in verse 27, he says, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of the fields. Now, I don't know if that's just his father saying that. Mother might say to him, go take a bath. You know, at that point, when you smell like that. The field here, if you look this particular world up in a, in, for a field in, in, the, in a Hebrew dictionary lexicon, it's a field that is ready for harvest. It's a field that has come to full fruit, ready for, to be productive, ready to give a blessing. He said, my son, you smell great. You smell, now, dad's a little bit more of an outdoorsman too here, all right? So he said, you smell like the, the smell of a, of a fresh field, a, a, a field that's ready for harvest. And it, what is it? Well, it's, it's a simple word, but let me tell you what it really is. It's a word of affirmation. It's a word of confirmation. It's not just to show it by a hug, or a handshake, a pat on the back or on the head. It's to go beyond that now. Now that communication becomes verbal. And what every dad, what we need to learn and, and, and continue to live out is this, this spoken message of affirmation, this spoken message of affection, uh, to just communicate that. And especially, it's important in, in the formative years. Why? We know as parents, one of our main tasks and responsibilities is that of discipling our children. You can use the word disciplining. Sometimes it is discipline. Sometimes it is reproof. Sometimes it is correction. It happens all the time. It's part of growing up, kids. You say, my parents are always tell them what to do. That's because you need to be told what to do. All right. If they don't tell you what to do, it won't get done. Clean your room. If they don't tell you, I can guarantee you, it won't get clean. All right. There'll be critters growing out of the furniture in there. So, yes, you need direction. You need, but at the same time, there needs to be an affirmation of communication of love. There's not just... You're, you, you appear as the chief judge and criticizer, all right? Because sometimes if that's all that's coming across, then that's the way it feels. And then there's that terrible mistake that sometimes parents make of just using abusive terminology with the kids. Oh, you're stupid. You're an idiot. You, you're an airhead. You're brain dead. What's the matter with you? You know, all those kind of things. If that's all a child gets, then certainly that's not a blessing. Uh, I do believe there is room for criticism, but in a constructive mode, not in a destructive mode. What are we saying to my kids? What are you saying to your kids? We're saying you're worth something. I'm glad that God gave you to me. You know, you're the answer to my prayers. You're what I wanted in a son. Just communicate acceptance and you communicate love. And by the way, don't wait to the last minute to do it. All too often, I, I've seen parents wait till they're on their deathbed to communicate a blessing to their children. I, I never got this particular blessing from an, from an earthly father. It came from my heavenly father. It was 21, 22 years of age before I realized that I had this acceptance. Praise God. The apostle Paul says, now we are accepted. We're affirmed in the beloved, in Jesus Christ. You know, it was a powerful moment when I first began to understand what this blessing was all about, even as a young man, to get down before the Lord and just say, hey, I received this affirmation. I received this confirmation from you. So many times because we didn't get it, we don't think it's necessary or understand the significance of passing it on to somebody else. So he speaks this message of affection. Don't wait till the last day of your life to do so. The third element of this is assuring your children of their significance in life and their significance to God. I remember reading a book, I almost got all the way through it. It was called The Search for Significance. And I can't remember if it was written by, it was a Christian author, it came out in the 70s, early 80s, I believe. The Search for Significance. But it was so true because the books uh, presented the idea and the concept that what everybody's looking for in life is significance, importance, and value. And that's so true. The Bible puts it in Proverbs that men seek honor and wealth you know, and the word honor has to do with being significant. People want to know they're loved. People want to be accepted. That's why kids do anything to be popular. That's why men do anything to be accepted on the job, within the group, why women do a multitude of things they do, whether it's bad or good, whatever. Many times it's just to feel I'm part of something. I'm significant. My, my life means something. The gangs are doing a pretty good job of, of communicating this in the culture that we live in today, but that's not where it's supposed to come from. It should be coming first and foremost from dads who are able to show the significance of their children. And, and how does he do that? Well, he does it by praying this blessing in verse 29. He says, may the nation serve you and may the people bow down to you and be the Lord of your brothers and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who be bless you be blessed. Now, 
That's what he's trying to say is, son, may you be everything that God wants you to be. May you be. And as you do that, guess what? I'll tell you one thing. When I'm being everything that God wants me to be, people bless me. All right. And I can tell you this. People who curse me get cursed. Not by me. I don't have to do it. Well, I, I'll, I'll confess. I've done it before. <laughs> it's Father's Day. I'll be humble. All right. But the idea is here. If you'll seek to be some, everything God desires you to be, you'll discover his blessings on your life. For those who've been a part of our Proverbs study that we do on Wednesday nights, we'll be coming back next month and continuing with that series. But you know that we're, we're Solomon, who is a father speaking to his son in the book of Proverbs. He's telling him the way of wisdom and he makes it very clear, son, there's a way which is going to bring the grace of God on your life and the blessing. And if you want to find significance and you want to find real value, in your life, it's not going to be in what the world dictates or how you think you ought to live according to whatever is possible in the human realm, but it's going to be discovered by discovering who you are in Christ and in God's will. There's a blessing for you. He says, son, there are two ways. And, and, and this is throughout the whole theme of the book of Proverbs and, and it deals with wisdom. You want to be wise? Here it is. There's two ways. One looks natural, acceptable and normal to the world, but the other does not. And it may be difficult and you're going to probably lose some friends and it's going to be hard, but it's the right way. But here's the thing, son. Wisdom will teach you this. You look down both roads. See beyond the present. Beyond the, 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 what's just quick and easy, accessible, something that feels good. Look beyond all that. Look to the end. Where's that road going? One leads to the blessings of God. One leads to death. And it's a father's responsibility to communicate, hey, you are valuable. You are important. You are honored. But it comes by knowing God and serving God and following God in your life. He said, it's made God bless you. And the only way to do that is to walk with God. There's a lot of paths you can take in life, but a lot of them are wrong. There's only one path that's going to lead to life. And it is a difficult path, and it's not a popular path. It's a narrow road, but it leads to life. And he's saying, my son, I want you to, to understand that your significance in life is going to come from a relationship found in the blessings of God on your life. You teach that in a number of ways. You do it by spending time. You do it by adding value to their life. Most people... You know, they don't have to tell anybody they're stupid. They just, we just kind of feel that naturally and normally. You say, why is that? Because our, of a fallen nature, a sin nature. It, it, you know, there's nothing that's, you know, we, we have to pump ourselves up with a false pride to feel like we've accomplished something. But then the world adds to that. And then sometimes parents add to that feeling of insecurity. But you're not going to find it. And, and a lot of modern teaching and parenthood and raising children talks about, you know, uh, always be, you know, showing your children value and significance. And, you know, it, that's why we don't give out, you know, everybody gets winner's ribbons now, you know, everybody gets the blue ribbon or whatever the winning prize is. Nobody loses anymore. We got, you know, first place winners and last place winners. <laughs> you called that losers when I was growing up, but I was usually in last place. So, but I, I, we need to educate you. You're going to lose in life sometime. You're going to be at the bottom of the heap sometime. But don't worry about that. That's not where your significance is going to come from. It's a father's blessing that helps a child learn the significance comes from God. And then he can hook up with God and get a relationship with God and start walking with God and find the value of value and the value of life in God. Which leads you to the fourth point where he's talking to him in verses. First of all, he said, may God give you the heavens and the dews, the earth, the riches, the abundance of grain. May God just pour out his grace on you. And then later he talks about, he begins to present to him this glorious future that's out before him. He says, may the nation serve you. May, may your sons of your mother bow down to you. May, may those you curse be cursed and those you bless be blessed. The idea, first of all, is, this, is this, this, the assurance them that there's a significant their life means something, that they're valuable. All right, but getting that in the proper perspective, you don't find that without God. I even heard a preacher say this recently, and I read it on many occasions where he says, you know, you need to realize how valuable you are to God. God, God holds you in such value that he sent Jesus to die for you. Now that sounds theologically correct, but it's not. All right, we are sinners. We rejected God. We turned our back on God. We chose ourselves. We chose our sin. That's worthless. All right. But here's the thing. God chose to put value on you, even though you had no value. That's love. And there's a difference. 
You know, one says, I deserve for Jesus to die for me because I'm valuable. No, you're not. Other says, I don't deserve its mercy and its grace. And you died for me. You express. But what did God do? Here's what parents do. He placed value upon you. Right. He gave value to you. It's what a parent does. with you. He gives them value. He honors them. And then he presents to them this glorious expectation of the future. I, I know that sometimes here in the recent weeks when we've been talking about the end times, I've walked out here kind of discouraged. You know, boy, these are miserable days. You know, the last days, men shall be lovers of themselves. There's, you know, the, the hatred of the nations and the racism in Matthew 24, all that's in the culture. And you just, you think, man, it's a sick world we live in. Amen. But at the same time, there's a bright day coming. There's a glorious expectation that we have. God's going to level everything. Jesus is going to be Lord. The nations will rule and he'll rule over them. There'll be peace and grace and glory. The expectation of the future. And I, I think it's even important as parents that we, we tell them about two futures. One, in their life, even though the world is diminishing, even though the culture is falling apart, God still has a glorious plan for your life in this, in this generation and in this time. You can be something. Your life can mean something. You can be the difference maker in the world you're living in. There's a great future. God wants to use you. God wants to use you to impact the world. God wants you to use you to impact families and friends. He wants to do something with you that's different from this self-seeking, self-gratifying world. Your life can have a glorious, glorious meaning. But all beyond that, there's a great day coming, the greatest day of all days, when we stand before God and every knee bows and every tongue confesses to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so as, as parents and as dads, we communicate that to our children. Don't be consumed by the negativity and the pessimism of this culture. Look up, your redemption draws nigh. And every warning about the disastrous days of the end times is always filled with optimism. Optimism, even in the midst of it. You said you shine like lights in this dark generation, as well as the future that comes. Dads, these are important principles, meaningful touch, spoken words, assuring them of value in Christ and through God and offering them hope for a great days and great blessings of God's grace. God is that perfect father. He has done all that for you. He came down. He touched us. He became one of us. He sent his son who dwelt among us. What did the apostle John say? We have held him. We have touched him with our hands. Our eyes have beheld him. There's a relationship that's been established, a fellowship, meaningful relationship of touching one another. Praise God. I can tell you the day that God reached down and touched me. September 27th, 1973. I have no doubt in my mind it was a divine touch from God. But also there was a divine acceptance and assuring me of his love for me and my significance was, could now be found in this new person that I am in Christ Jesus. And obviously throughout the scripture, he continues as a heavenly father to assure me of the glorious days. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's a pretty good promise for the future, is it not? Listen, I, I, want to, I want to just conclude with this simple story here. And it's a true story. We're all familiar with the story of the prodigal son. But let me tell you about a story I, I read, and I'll read little portions of it here, of a story in, in a modern setting is told by Philip Yancey in a book that he wrote called What's So Amazing About Grace? And this kind of shows you what's so amazing about grace. He tells of a prodigal daughter. She grew up in Traverse City, uh, I guess it's Michigan. She was disgusted with her old fashioned parents who didn't like the way she dressed, who didn't like her nose ring, who didn't like her music she listened to. They didn't like the length of her skirts. And in the story she tells, she ends up running away. She ends up in Detroit where she meets a man, she said, who drove the biggest car she'd ever seen. His name affectionately is called Boss. You kind of get an idea where this is going as a young underage teenage girl. He obviously begins to be her pimp and recognizing that since she's underage, that men would pay a premium price for her and she goes to work for him. Things seem pretty good for a while. At least no one's trying to get her to change. Said, then I got sick for a few days and it amazed me how quickly the boss turned mean. Before you know it, she's thrown out on the streets without a penny to her name. She's still turning a couple of her tricks to, uh, of her trade night and 
day to get a little money, which mostly goes to support her drug habit. One night, she said, while sleeping on the metal grates of the city just to stay warm, she said, I began to feel less like a woman of the world and more like a little girl. She said, I began to whimper and to cry. God, why did I leave? She went on to say, my dog back home eats better than I do now. And she realizes at this point, more than anything in the world, she just wants to go home. She tells the story, she says, three straight calls home, got three straight connections with the, my answering machine of my family. Finally, she just leaves a message. Mom, Dad, it's me. I was uh, wondering about maybe coming home. I'm catching a bus up your way. It'll be there around midnight tomorrow. If you're not there, I understand. She said during the seven hour bus ride to get home, she's preparing a speech to give her father. When the bus came to the stop in Traverse City, she gets off the bus and the bus driver says, you have 15 minutes, the bus leaves. She said, 15 minutes to decide my life. She walked into the terminal, not knowing what to expect, but here's the story. But not one of a thousand scenes that have played out in her mind prepared her for what she saw. There in the bus, ter bus terminal in Traverse City stands a group of 40 brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandmother, and great-grandmother to boot. They're all wearing party hats, blowing noisemakers, taped across the wall of the terminal is a computer-generated banner that read, Welcome home! Out of the crowd of well-wishers breaks her dad. She stares out through the tears, quivering in her eyes, and begins her little memorized speech. And he interrupts her. He says, hush, child. We have no time for that. No time for apologies. We're going to be late. There's a big party waiting for you at home. The acceptance and the grace of a father. I'll say to you this morning, we have the same kind of heavenly father as in this story, as in the prodigal story, the prodigal son scripture of a heavenly father who waits to embrace us. My first word is to you dads. If you never had the blessing extended, if you never had the blessing extended, I want you today in a moment to bow your heads and receive that blessing from your heavenly father who wants to reach down and touch you, who wants to speak his word to your spirit, to your heart who wants to confirm you and show you the significance that you are accepted in him. You're beloved. You're his son. He treasures you. He loves you. Receive that promise of a great future that he promises to you if you walk in his light and his life. How many dads who are trying to be dads have never even received this kind of blessing before? And I believe God wants to give you that on this day and extend that to you. I pray that you'll have the grace to receive it. Second of all, there's probably dads who had that ended today and didn't recognize what it was. You need to stop for a moment and thank God that you had that in your life. And it was there. And God blessed you in that regard. And thank your dad living our life. I believe the father gives messages. Say, dad, tell dad, I love him. Father in heaven, tell my dad, I love him. So where's that in the Bible? I don't know, but I believe it's true. This, if this relationship was so meaningful and so established in scriptures of family and home and father and wife and spouse, hey, then I believe that God, you know, has put such value upon it that he'll take care of it for us. Hallelujah. I would say to this to children, if you are in a home that's a single parent, that you realize that you do have a father. The scriptures makes it very clear in more than one place that he is a father to the fatherless. And you can call on him and you can reach out to him and you'll find him ready at all times. To you children who have fathers, thank God for what you have. Thank God for what you have. See what God does in your life as a result of you honoring your father as the scripture tells you to do. So I want us to stand with our heads bowed. There's a big banner over the wall. You can't see it, but it's written in.